Hey guys, welcome back to Flipper Flicks. We have a special fireside chat. Ooh. I know, fancy. We're mm -hmm. we're doing something new. Something very new. And yeah, so um, we're doing a weird cold open too. <laughs> so yeah, Chris isn't even here yet. You're going to hear me talk again, and Tim and Sam talk, and then <laughs> a new person. Whoa. Dun, dun, dun. But it, I'm going to pass this off. No. You're not uh, going to explain what a fireside chat is? Fireside chat, yes. I'll explain <laughs> that. Fireside chat where we're bringing um, somebody who was involved in the filmmaking process or multiple people's. Um, in this case, it's a director. Mm -hmm. And yeah, he's going to come on and talk about his film. Yep. All right. Now, now I'm going to tag. <laughs> did you say your name? I'm Adam. <laughs> well, I got him. <laughs> I did say I. That's not true. Did. I didn't say Adam. Anyways, go ahead. Yo. Is it my turn? Yeah. Okay. Just make sure. I wasn't sure. But I'm Tim. There we said it. Hi, Tim. Hello. Hey, Tim. <laughs> uh, yeah, this should be fun. Fireside chat. Um, but we have social media, if you're unaware. Now you're aware. Uh, mostly Boom. on Instagram and Twitter. Uh, follow us there. See what we're doing. Our shenanigans. Chat with us. Send us messages. Whatever you like. Uh, we'll give hints at to what we're watching. What we're what we have coming up. So follow along where you can listen to us, uh, Anchor, Spotify, Apple, other platforms. Uh, they're just randomly out there. There's so many of them. I'm not going to name them all. Uh, we have a website where you can go and give us recommendations, whatnot. Uh, it's flavorflakes.com. And we post episodes every Thursday at 1 p.m. Eastern time. But sometimes we have bonus episodes, so it's good to follow us and find out what those episodes are going to be and get them when, when they're hot, when they drop. Yeah. Oh. Drop it like it's hot. Wait, don't drop it. Pick it up when it's hot. Yeah, Pick it up when it's hot. Ugh, ugh, I don't know. Hot potato. <laughs> well, I'm Sam. Oh, okay. I was just, Tim, I was just like right there. Ready. I know. You were like ready for it. Um, and so as they talked about, we have a director on the pod today. His name is Chris Haig. Um, and he directed Song for Hope, the Ryan Anthony story. Is a documentary, um, and so I'll give you the synopsis that um, was submitted in the Beaufort International Film Festival catalog. So it goes, Ryan Anthony, regarded as one of the greatest trumpet virtuosos ever, was only 42 when he was diagnosed with cancer and given just months to live. Faced with an uncertain future, an uphill battle full of hospital stays, chemotherapy, and blood transfusions, Ryan continued to share his talent with audiences around the world through solo performances, master classes, and concerts. So I feel like this film is um, a good one because it, it's really connected to music and it's connected to mm. Ryan. And um, as you hear Chris speak, you'll you'll see how passionate he is oh, about the so film. Oh, amazing. <laughs> as well as... Um, his friendship. His friendship with Ryan, yeah. So um, we've got him on tonight and it'll be really exciting. Um Song for Hope is in the it's in a couple different film festivals, but um, if you're looking to watch it, it's in the Malibu Film Festival, which runs um, this week, and it's only five dollars for a pass to see the film. So if you're listening to Chris thinking, "Wow, this sounds amazing!" like go ahead and get that pass, and you can see it. Um, I'm sure he'd be really appreciative. Yeah, yeah. So, so Tim, do the thing. The cue the singing drafts. Hey guys, welcome back, and we have a special treat for you today. We have the director of the movie, A Song for Hope, Chris Haig, on our call today. Call? I don't know why I called oh. her a call. <laughs> call, like call, talk, <laughs> chat, whatever, you know. Listen, yeah. it, I'm British. We've got different names for things. I like the fact that you're experimental with language, you know. Yeah, uh, you know. We call the parking lot the car park. You know, yeah. there's, there's lots of weird sort of you things. You have like extra E's do. at the end of some of your words, and I just don't get that. In yeah. news, you like, guys got rid of it all. That was it. You, as soon that's, as you, that's a whole as soon as you chose scenario. that 1776 thing, you were like, get rid of all these English words. <laughs> we don't need that. You should like scale color. it down. No. Mm -hmm. yeah. Town? No. T O N T O W N. Yeah. We no, thought no. we were better than you until you. Yeah, we thought we were better than you until you went to space and we're like, damn. Well, shit. It's not as good anymore. Well, yeah. personally, I haven't it, been it there. Passed but, us you know. on the space thing. <laughs> 
Hey, my, so my mother-in-law works for SpaceX. I don't know. You can definitely put that in because I won't say her name. Right? <laughs> okay, okay. okay. Yeah, she works for, works for SpaceX and she, and like, it's kind of kills me as a, you know, sort of a creative writer and a guy who's doing films and stuff because no matter what, I'll never be able to be as good as that because what she does is she writes effectively what they take up to fix things up in space, right? There's yeah. the astronauts go up and they need a manual to help them fix things up on the ISS or any of that oh, stuff, the space the station. She writes those manuals, right? So Yay. the crazy thing for me is it's like, I can't walk around to her place because no matter what, when you say it's not rocket science, literally what she does is rocket science. <laughs> so so are, you, are you saying you're the next <laughs> Jack Black? His his mom also worked at, I think, NASA. She, she sent, yeah, she was the, wasn't she one of the people who was involved in the moon landing or something? I'm not, hey, something I'm not, I'm like not that. As as Jack Black. <laughs> <laughs> not, in the, not in the slightest. <laughs> he can grow beards. There's lots you of things. Grow beard. he can grow Why beard. did I go right for the beard you. thing? I don't know. Beard was the first place I went to with Jack Black. I can't believe it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But anyways. He's a great yeah. actor. Anyway, yeah, sorry, carry on. This no, you're good, you're good. No, that's, that's okay, because I was going to say, uh, the first hard question up today, uh, just tell us a little bit about yourself, you know, how you became Chris and <laughs> how did you become Chris, Chris? I was I was born on a summer's day in 1986. No, uh I was I mean, there's a lot about me really. I came from the UK, obviously that's why I've got this strange voice, but I came from northern UK. So it's uh like a li- little town called Rochdale. And there's some crazy stories I could go into about Rochdale, but again, I'll just keep talking your ears off. But <laughs> yeah, that's where I come from. They've got a great bridge that says the birthplace of cooperation, which is because they created co-op, right? But everybody just thinks that we're being really smarmy and think that we created where people co- you know, cooperate with each other. Yeah. Um, so we've got that. Yeah, but anyway, so I come from and, that and place. Chris. I'm going on a tangent. Cooperation <laughs> with Chris. Yeah. Yeah. Good He's going to be on so the road that- soon. That's I hope so. Um, <laughs> other than Gracie Fields, well, there's Gracie Fields. She was a singer. You ready for this one? And then the other claim to fame, apparently, is that our town hall, which if you ever type it in, you know, have a look at it. It's cool. It's a really cool town hall. It looks a little bit like Big Ben, the big clock. But oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it, Adolf Hitler. I know this. This took a turn. Adolf Hitler <laughs> before the war, he was like into architecture and art and everything, right? Before yeah. he became all sort of despot, right? He apparently saw a picture of our town hall and said, "Right, when I take over the world and I'm like a megalomaniac, I want that taken down brick by brick and oh rebuilding in the Führer Plaza, right?" Oh, so gosh. that is the other claim to fame of Rochdale. <laughs> so if I could add a <laughs> little ray of sunshine. In amongst cooperation and Hitler, then, you know, I think I've, I've done all right. <laughs> That's very good. <laughs> Told you I'd go on a tangent. I've not got to meet hey, you. So, <laughs> yeah, so you're not in a weird realm. I, I am the, t- well, we all get on tangents, but I, yeah. I am not, I do it a lot. So. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'll tell you, so uh, a quick background of me. So when I was back in the UK, I was a teacher. And okay. I taught English. I taught, I taught English. Um, because it was just the best one to get a job in. I actually studied classics and ancient history and Latin and Greek. Oh, you you got a fan right here. Yeah, went super super down that route. I had to translate the Aeneid for my first year, the Virgil's Aeneid with Dido and all that. So literally went through all the epic poetry and everything, studied how it was written with iams and dithyrambs and stuff like that. So watching the pacing of, of like poetry and stuff. So then I went, started teaching English in like high schools in England, there's one that's called failings that's not far from me, which is, you know, it's kind of a diverse area. It's very difficult. Okay. We've got a lot of people coming in who are from Europe there. We've got lots of people from all different countries who are all in this area. So you're teaching kids, some of whom don't speak a lot of English, you know, and stuff like that. So that was quite exciting to do that um, as a teacher. And then what I started doing because I was bored just doing that. Um, I was also a musician at the same time. I've been a musician since I was about 11 years old. Okay. And I played a, a thing called the, the tenor horn, which yeah, is. Yeah, I was going to bring that up because you said it. I, I have a decent oh, memory. I'm just giving a story about me right now. <laughs> oh, yeah. No, no, no. Yeah. I just remember you talking about the um, the tenor horn when you at the yeah. film festival. Oh, yeah. Yeah, real so quick I background. played the tenor horn. It was, it was a brass. It was a brass. Um, I was a, I was in brass bands. And okay. if you've ever seen, like, I don't know what your knowledge is of British film, but we had a film called Brass Stuff that had Ewan McGregor in it, who's now oh, Obi-Wan, obviously. What? Pete, Pete Postlethwaite was in it as a... Yeah, Pete Postlethwaite was the conductor of the band who was in uh, Jurassic Park. Um, he was the uh, apothecary in Romeo and Juliet, Baz Luhrmann's one, oh, nice. and in a bunch of other things. Steven Spielberg loved Pete Postlethwaite as an actor, said he was like one of the greatest of all time. Um, huh. 
and he's the conductor. Yeah, true story. Type him in. It's a really difficult name to spell, though. I'll have a good time spelling Pete Postlethwaite. Right? <laughs> Just go for Spielberg and type Pete and you'll get there. Right? But yeah, so he, he was the conductor. Then there was this Tara Fitzgerald, who's most recently she's been in. Um, oh, God, what's she been in? Most recently she's been in um, Game of Thrones and stuff like that. But okay. she played the flugel in it. So she played the instrument that Ryan plays and stuff like that. So really cool thing. And that was the band I played for. So I played for this band that are in Brast Off and not when it was filmed because that was filmed in like the 90s. But I when I played for them, yeah, check it. They did like a world tour and everything. They were called Grimethorpe Collier Band. And I went traveling with them and like we did tours all over the place. It was great. Went to, you know, Holland and places like that. And that was one thing that I was doing whilst also teaching. And then obviously because I've done music, I started teaching music. So that sort of introduced me to this sort of area of music and musical structure and stuff like that. And you start realizing there's quite a lot of similarities between, you know, in the classical Greek poetry, you know, oral poetry by Homer and stuff like that. Yep. As you work your way through rhythm and pacing and everything like that becomes quite integral to a lot of art. And all I did was I just started looking at these different structures and that started getting me into this idea of making films. And then the crazy thing was when I was a teacher in England, uh, in, back in England, and I was teaching at this school, Valinge, I was doing um, primary school music teaching in okay. my spare time as well at, at like little ones. So I was teaching, you know, little kids how to play trombone and little kids how to, you know, all these crazy things. We played ukulele, which I was pretty crap nice. at, but I learned it off oh, the you, you know. <laughs> yeah, we were, we were studying that song Lava from Disney, and I realized nice. by about the third bar, it was really difficult for kids to play. So then we were like, <laughs> okay, just stop on, stop on bar four, five, six, seven, and back on it on eight. So yeah, it was like out. <laughs> It was cool, actually. And the great thing was I got to teach special needs kids music as well. And it's amazing. The, the, like, they love every second of it. It's like, you can really see that. So that was yeah. something that really impacted on me, you know. And then for some weird reason, and now, again, taking a left turn completely, I became a comedian and started doing uh, stand-up comedy in my nights. I left the band and I left the musical. <laughs> yeah. And I started doing, started doing stand-up comedy. But here you go. You ready for it? I needed to bring all that stuff together, the music together and everything like this. So uh, you are gonna, you guys are going to wonder who you've brought on here now. But heck, I, you know, you, you've called. had like, you've had like uh, three different careers. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, I did. So I did stand up comedy and I started writing shows for a band and, and coming up with musical oh, nice. licks and stuff like this. And we did a comedy music show that was an Oktoberfest show where this Oktoberfest band that was like eight people in it and then me fronting it. Uh, we went and toured the country and played to all these different places. They were called the Jaeger Maestros, like nice. Jaeger Meister. But, and yeah. we got free Jaeger everywhere, which was yes. really bad for my liver. Yeah, and, it's either, and it's either I, hit or miss. You either yeah. love it or hate it. And I was in a blonde wig uh, and a lederhosen and, and a black Prussian jacket and called myself Hertz Von Rental. Perfect. <laughs> yeah. Welcome to the party, pal. Oh, <laughs> Yeah, welcome. Um, we we didn't get to Oktoberfest, but we they had a series of bars that were like, I don't know, a bit like uh, I'm trying to think of what kind of uh, what your your regular bars are, are like a wood ranch, but not with food. It was all just drinking. Everybody was getting absolutely plastered. So kind of like a sports bar. They had this sports bar um, uh, sort of a franchise that was all over the UK, and it was called Beer Keller. And literally, you went in, went downstairs, and they were long. Oktoberfest tables and everybody's yeah. drinking what is it was effectively two pints of beer out of these massive steins yeah every and and all I do was so I learned that right we're going to teach them the drinking song the German drinking song which is I'm prosy I'm prosy yeah. yeah. yep. so, right? so real quick we actually go we, we, we yeah I'm apologizing <laughs> not yeah, on the film go, yet we, we actually uh, we did go to we went to Munich for October fest in 2019 the three oh of us my did. god yeah. so, so talking you about guys need side. to get to england man our October <laughs> fest is a lot more hardcore we used to get we used to do all kinds of crazy stuff on that as i said how long have you got we, we might have to push little sand little sack more you know it's great and everything but they've got a lot of stories we may have to do a second part yeah when we were um, we were going all over the, the uk we did <laughs> we did edinburgh fringe festival which was really cool um and we were up there for like a month oh no it was like three weeks actually we didn't get the first weekend but um we went up there and me and this band basically did uh, the drinking songs at the beginning nice. and then we did a bunch of drinking games just crazy drinking games like like mad stuff we used to get people wearing um 
uh, pans around the waists what? and then they'd have like m- massive dessert spoons suspended behind the legs uh, between the legs and then they would pull the legs apart it would swing up and it would play a note on the pan right <laughs> and then we would play this tune and it would be tuned it would tuned into arpeggios so we had six of them and this craziest thing was you're gonna have to bleep this uh, we called it the cock and spiel. And when I, uh, when, I, I, met, I, I when I met, when I met, bleep that. <laughs> well, when, if people are into the music, they'll like that pun. Right. But yeah. Um, yeah. Ryan, 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 I'm, I met Ryan. I've got a video somewhere. I met Ryan in Banff in Calgary, Canada, and we did this sort of fun sort of music sort of fun show and okay. I, and they were like, Chris, you're going to have to do some comedy. What can you do? And I was like, ah, give me a few, a few tins and, and uh, you know cans and empty cans of tuna and anything like that and i'll see if we can come up with a new cock and spiel and the next thing you know sorry i won't keep saying it and uh yeah, ryan 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 was ryan was the first musician of that one and uh, i've got a video somewhere and he can't hold it together because they're all hammered and yeah. it was ryan it was jens linderman Naturally. it was like alain trudel this like great canadian conductor who's like you know he conducts like i think it's vancouver symphony or something like a, a really well-established conductor stood there with a tun- tuna can suspended between his legs trying to hit it with a fork it was just crazy and uh yeah that was my so then i decided to make a film and yeah. <laughs> no, I, after after all that after i'd done the comedy and done edinburgh fringe festival then i decided to go out to turks and caicos islands in the caribbean to film lifestyle videos uh for a tv channel like hotel tv channel so anytime anybody went in into these hotels and just turned on the tv we'd have a video or videos playing of like you know uh, an interview with a local restaurant all that kind of stuff yeah. you get like a local internet no celebrity I mean. that's like there it like is somewhat instagram <laughs> influencer Boom. there Just it is go. yeah they've got 35 followers and everybody on the yeah. island thinks that they're the it girl. there was a one yeah <laughs> All right, carry on. I'll stop talking about me for a minute and you can ask another question. Because, yeah. I mean, well, I was saying, answered, the Turks and Caicos things. You answered <laughs> one that. of our questions without us even asking. Yes. Yeah. I'm amazed, I'm amazed I've not covered like 20 by now. That was quite <laughs> oh, I, I got, We tried I to be clever, you know. Deep in, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Have you ever dressed in a blonde wig and called yourself Hertz Von Rettel? Yes. There it is. <laughs> that Next was, that was you got it. Question. I, yeah. That was my third Can't question. I can't believe you guessed that one. I dug real deep into your history and whatnot. No, I'm just kidding. But so right. you can go ahead. Oh, well, I was just going to say, so you already told us a little bit of how you first met Ryan, but I guess when yeah. did you sort of decide to take this project forward with him? Uh, immediately. Uh, so <laughs> it was kind of crazy. I, I was in a really, de- I, was, I wasn't feeling good. I was in a bad place. And my friend Jens is a great trumpet player, Jens Lindemann. And I'd recorded with him with my brass band uh, at that time, which is called Foden's Band. And uh, we'd done this recording that was amazing, all great jazz trumpet tunes and stuff. And he gave me a call and he just said, uh, I think I'd, I'd had a breakup or something, you know, an ex of mine had cheated on me or something, I don't know. But either way, he went, oh, you should come out to Banff in Calgary and uh, play with the all-star band. And bearing in mind, I've been like a first horn. So it's not solo horn, like the middle guy, you yeah. know, the guy who kind of has a really good time in music, but I'm no kind of virtuoso. It's not like, you know, you've got the next, I don't know, Joshua Bell or any shit like that, you know. <laughs> anyway, so I goes over and I'm part of this all star band, and clearly they saw a thumb because these guys are some of the great and girls are some of the greatest musicians, brass musicians in history. And there's me sitting there, you know, <laughs> next to a guy who's clearly angry because one of his mates can't come because I've got the ticket or I'm sitting there on the stage. So I'm sitting there. There was one point I dropped my horn and Ryan said it sounded like a trash can. So I knew we'd be friends. Um, and then, yeah, basically. Uh, all of these great musicians used to finish playing and then kind of all go off to themselves, all go off, not nastily, they would just go off and practice by themselves or they'd go yep. off to their own room and have a nap or whatever. Ryan didn't. Ryan would just come to the bar uh, and we'd just sit and chat. And, you know, um, it. you wouldn't have known that he had anything wrong with him yeah. in a million years. I know that gets said quite a lot. It's quite cliche, but definitely not right. Like he'd stood up, he'd played the Alpine Symphony, which is like this gargantuan trumpet part like he's hitting notes that you just wouldn't hear being hit cleanly absolutely perfectly like a cd style performance just in a rehearsal and he was so good so when he came over to chat and then you find out that he's waiting on blood test results and that was it he was waiting on his blood test results from this doctor because apparently his cancer was like 50 odd percent which obviously is a lot less than 
it is in the film, but it was it was high. And when he told me about the things he was experiencing, it, you couldn't really kind of fathom it. And then we went on stage, we played another like three or four times at, at this great festival um, with this all-star brass. As I said, me kind of ducking and diving, hoping that nobody realizes <laughs> that I'm definitely not an all-star. And then, <laughs> yeah, me and Ryan just laughed because I told him stories, you know, I made him, I, you know, thankfully because of my comedy past, I, me and him just laughed and, I, and he just enjoyed me telling stories. Then he'd tell me stories about crazy things he did when he was on the road with Canadian brass, you know, and like just we had a really good laugh. and. After that, I was just like, I need to tell your story. And does in fact, if you if you're friends with me on Facebook, which I don't forget if you are, you know, you, you nasty buggers. No, uh, if you, <laughs> if I you're friends with me on Facebook, Facebook wow. <laughs> oh, if you go on, if you go on my pinned post, that's 2018, and I was like, Ryan Anthony. Every time Ryan would post something, I was friends with him. I was like, this guy is absolutely incredible. I need to make a movie about his life, and I just kept saying it, and then. You know, eventually, yeah, that was that just became the norm. It was like this is going to happen. It just has yeah. to happen. And however we're going to get it to happen is how it happens. <laughs> is that when you wrote the seventy-page um, doc document for the production company? It was long. It was longer than that. The, the first oh, couple of pages, like the first couple of pages, was like two pages, and it was just like a nice kind of like this is Ryan, blah blah blah. Mm -hmm. And we had a great. The, I mean, uh, we had a great, great camera operator called called Ben who came on board. He was great. Okay. He was involved with the project. And basically, yeah, we started with that. And then <laughs> I started coming to get because documentary, you're wanting to capture this this stuff. So everything yeah. began with just a couple of pages, then five pages, then six pages. And then it was like, right, we need to do a pitch deck. So then the pitch deck got written, and that was like, you know, 50 pages. And then <laughs> everything just slowly got out of handle. And then when everything was kind of captured, I started looking at the interviews and how we could do the interviews to help us tell the story. And the brilliant thing with Ryan was Ryan always, Ryan had the stories he wanted to tell, I think, you know, and I think that he and I had been talking. So, cause I used to have, this is again, another sidetrack, but I used <laughs> to have Velcro on the side of my work computer. I haven't even told you about how I came to LA yet, but I used to have Velcro on the side of my computer screen. And I used to just with, with like, you know, the gripper on the back and I used to just stick it to that. I know I should have bought one of the proper things. By the way, I used to just stick my, my phone to the side of my computer and we would FaceTime whilst he was having blood transfusions. So I learned about Ryan's life whilst he was having chemotherapy. I learned about Ryan's life because wow. like in yeah. the film, he does 92 hour chemotherapy. But when he's in there, he's he's restless as hell because he's in absolute agony. And also he doesn't know at what point it's going to kick him mm -hmm. and kill him literally so he wants to be on the phone in case anything happens i think and you know he, he just used to call me be like oh yeah you know my cancer's at this percent whatever it was just kind of like he yeah just kept me updated with things and we chatted about his background and you know i tried to get as much into the film as possible but there's some things you can't get you know there's some things that are just mesmerizing ryan's doctor was found for him through playing he wouldn't have got that doctor had it not come through play. And it came about by this. He went to this other, he went to another doctor and this doctor's son happened to play trumpet and was just like, are you Ryan Anthony? And he was like, yeah. And he says, I've got this pain under my rib here. And this guy says, right, I'm not like a foremost surgeon in this thing, but I'm going to send you to this guy, Dr. Brian Berryman, who's, you know, a mate of mine. And he says, and he'll get you seen right away again something that probably isn't great for other people who don't have musical connections, but the fact that he was a trumpet player, he ended up, I think he ended up teaching that guy's son as well. I was like, oh, thanks. Nice. You know what I mean? Like, Ryan, thanks, it's thanks just for like, doing that. it's crazy. I met with, this is another one, just a, a random musical link and a random side note. Again, cut me off here. I'll do a pause. Oh, it's fine. Right, and then you could cut that in. Right, But uh, Bramwell Tovey, who's, who's a conductor who worked, I only played under once and it was at Foden's band. He is a fantastic worldwide conductor. He's played, he's conducted the LA Phil, he's conducted all these others. He had cancer that was a tumor that was round his ribs, right? Mm -hmm. uh, on his right hand side. And it was wrapped around his ribs. And he still went on stage and conducted Oh like with his with his right arm under his arm under there was all these things and he was literally in agony then they took the ribs out and put oh. him plastic ribs in what? and told him to try and keep it try and keep calm and literally three weeks later or something like that he was conducting the la phil and doing oh all the fireworks God. and everything with the 1812 <laughs> overture and he sat there and then he's so i'm sitting talking to him and, and it was the day after and i went maestro well done and all this and he got back to me on Twitter and just went, come and meet me at the Sunset Maquis, which is like, you know, this great 
or yeah. tell in Hollywood. Talk about Hollywood, eh? right? And <laughs> he goes, come up here, and there's a big poster of Jim Morrison on the wall and stuff. And he's talking to me about stuff, and he goes, I want to say I'm very interested in the film because Ryan Anthony reached out to me in the final weeks of his life to talk me through what I would experience through the chemo and all this kind of stuff, what I did this, what I did that. Literally talked to him and then said, so you're going to be fine, you need to do this, but you don't ever stop conducting, you've got to keep conducting. That's the reason he kept conducting. And that's one that we were midway through, it. well, we'd finished editing the film, midway through getting it out there, and it was like, I could have got this guy involved, I could have got that. But there's so many people were coming out of the woodwork. And then Ryan died, so then more people came out of the woodwork with their stories, and you're like, how much more can we get into this film it so just you're gonna you're gonna have like a, a steamroller a docu-series after this right yeah oh, it sounds we like. could you know i've got i've met i've got a i've got a g-tech drive next to me that's like 20 terabytes or something and it's just crammed full of stuff the, luke and tara who are my colleagues on this fantastic yep. you know luke's an ed, luke's an editor and cinematographer and and a producer and tara's our producer who literally oversees everything now and like you know, we we were mesmerized by everything with Ryan. We were mesmerized by just the stuff we were capturing sometimes, you know, literally following yeah. him. And that's why we had to try and get that into the film, because the guy didn't stop. If you told him he had a week left to live, he would see that as, right, I've got five more days to see if I can play. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> he didn't give him monkeys. Awesome. He really didn't. He didn't see a, an end point, really. And that was you, like... You can really see that cool in thing. the film, he, too. You did a really yeah. great job at, like, um, just displaying that. Mm -hmm. oh thanks <laughs> yeah so on your terabyte i guess or your hard drive there's yeah. obviously tons of footage but like what i guess was the hardest choice you had to make in the editing room can you narrow it down to one there's some beautiful bits i mean i wanted to see more ryan smile you know Aww, like don't get yeah. me wrong you want but it's it but he was just laughing all the time and we got it into a few of the montages expertly cut together by luke you know and mm -hmm. I've got all, all the stuff where I'm standing next to, you know, Luke and Ryan and we're just filming and we're just hanging out. You know, that day that he's flying the kite, that was just him hanging out with us for a couple of hours. You know what I mean? And it was <laughs> oh, just a yeah. really nice time to hang out. And yeah, I'd say, in terms of on the cutting room then, phew, there's a few things. I mean, like he talked, it, we did a seven hour long interview with him because there was nothing really in the can until January 2020. Okay. You know, uh, with, with with Ryan, he did a lot of talking to the camera. A lot of times, we just left. You know, like we, I flew out to when Ryan got pneumonia. I flew out there and yeah. didn't film anything because me. That was the tough. I think I think that was a really tough bit when Ryan got pneumonia. We wondered what to put in. And was I was that was in like about, the autumn of nineteen, right? Yeah, that was no no November two thousand and nineteen. I was uh, I was at. Um, I was in Santa Monica. Um, it was like my wife and I, before we were getting married, you know, it was like kind of like our little getaway. And I'd spoken to Ryan on the Friday. And yeah, by the Sunday, Nikki was texting me. Ryan and I were tech joking um, uh, on the Saturday. Like he was like, oh, they're going to take me in. So I was like, oh, yeah, no problem, mate. Blah, blah, blah. And he was joking about, I said, do you need me to come over and give you a sponge bath or something like that? Just like a bit of a joke. Yeah, just like cheap then, shit. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that was it. And then two days later, I get a text and it's, hey, Chris, it's Nikki. You know, I've got it somewhere. And it says, less of the sponge bath jokes now or something like that. And oh, no. oh, Ryan's, no. actually, Ryan's actually really sick. And then I'm like, oh, my God. So, yeah, thankfully, I had Tara, I had Luke, you know, and they literally phoned, phoned through, got me on a flight, and I was out there within about I don't know, two and a half hours, I was, uh, three and a half hours, I was over in uh, in Dallas, walked in, and this is how it changes. So they were like, Ryan's admitted, Ryan's not good on the Sunday. I think yeah. I got there about, got there about 10, 30, 11 o'clock on the Sunday night. I've gone off on a tangent here, but I will get back to what I've cut, or what was cut, <laughs> and why I'm going This is all good, it. this is right, all good. <laughs> But yeah, I mean, I mean, I got there, walked into the hospital, walked past Nikki's friend Noel, who must have been there with him overnight. And I, there was a guy coming out and I said, oh, is he in there? Is he OK? And he said, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I took that to mean, oh, go on in. And I walked in and Ryan was sitting on the commode. Right. <laughs> and I went, bloody hell. I went, I've flown 1500 miles to watch you taking a shit. And then this guy comes and goes, oh, no, no, he's not done yet. I said, I can see that. And Ryan's watching. So it was just like... That was the kind of guy he was. So, yeah, I would have loved to have had a lot more Ryan laughs, but it's just, you know, you've got to think about, there was a comedian I used to, like, used to really admire in the UK. I think I got to play with him once on stage. Um, I did, like, a warm-up. I wasn't, like, you know, anywhere near his level. He always used to say, your audience are giving you time. 
and you have got to earn that time and you've got to make sure that you do not get them wrestling in the chairs or pissing about you know you've just got to have it constantly drive forwards and you know and then when you get to a moment that kind of stops they feel it and they give you it they allow you it and yeah that was that 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 was something that we wrestled with but i would have loved to have got loads of more in we had about ryan and his wife nikki and how they met and how they used to fight over video games and stuff because ryan was completely broke and he was like you know trying to get away he was like a proper scrounger in those days because obviously he was living in his car and stuff and nikki's got great stories about it as i said like um and she used to work in this like little italian so we had this idea of like this say we i had this idea and then luke cut it together of this like we'd go ryan then nikki and back and forth and back and forth almost like an italian vespers you know a little bit like um not the not the car i mean the singing right a little bit like these out a solo becomes a duet that was the idea yeah. and then yeah cut cut that got cut for uh the rb bit where ryan grows up and everything like this so instead of going more complex in terms of just this soloist uh just uh, sorry just ryan as a as an individual player like we had in his theme at the beginning by the time it's Ryan growing up and Ryan becoming a great player and Ryan winning awards and all this kind of stuff, instead of going duet and having two instrumentalists and two people uh, narrating, we decided that for the score, it would be um, syncopated rhythms. So Ryan growing up and Ryan becoming more complex in the way he plays and Ryan becoming more uh, experimental and stuff like that. So, do, de, do, de, do, do, de, you know, it's very <laughs> kind of syncopated and that same kind of rhythm and that same kind of syncopated uh uh, feel comes back in the uh, teaching bit later on. Yeah. So that kind of is Ryan was growing up, and now these guys that he's laying the path for are growing up too. So all of that is kind of callbacks and and links to the structure of the film, really, which is what we're aiming for. Yeah. I went off on a random tangent there. Well, it, it all, it's all good. It's all good. Now, like, do you have like a three-hour director's cut version of it? No, sadly not. I, I, the, in, <laughs> <laughs> in the room, it was in the room. It was uh, me, Luke and Tara, or Luke, Tara and I, as I should say, as a former English teacher. <laughs> I had a massive wall that they'd, I mean, they'd just moved in. They'd moved into this place right before COVID, COVID hit. And we were all working for, for Orange Robot, you know, the production company. Yep. And they do a lot of EPK stuff. Like they're going on sets for Apple TV shows and for things like that. Oh, nice. and, and they're, Fancy. yeah, that's cool. They go on and film all the BTS, which is really cool. Not the not the band in Korea, right? But they <laughs> go on and they film the behind the scenes. They do interviews and stuff. We did something with David Guetta together. So when the COVID pandemic hit, we just decided, right, well, I moved in with them for a little bit just to kind of work on the, the show on the show on the film uh worked on bringing together this ryan doesn't stop this was another thing about the film <laughs> ryan ryan never stops so stop, therefore, stop. If, yeah if the film if the film is is not moving fast enough he, he's got other projects that he's going to be doing and that was the thing with when covid hit Ryan was like, right, I'm having my fifth stem cell. Um, I've got this, I've got that, I've got this, I've got that. What do you think? And I was like, Ryan, what the hell, man? We're, we're, we're <laughs> over here, we're not filming anything. He goes, no, no, I'm not even asking you to film anything. I'm not telling you to film anything. I just want to do this. So we started talking about things. And then, yeah, one of the things that we came up with was that, you know, we'd seen a couple of these bands, like literally it had been a couple of these bands doing these little sort of like segments with all the, the people in the boxes and, you know, all the players yeah, off and play yeah, yeah. together. All the you um, know, sea shanties. And, that was around when the sea yeah. shanties kind of oh, like, yeah. bonkers. <laughs> I was exactly, for it. Right? I was and, for it. Oh, thank, thank God Ryan wasn't doing a sea shanty. Yeah. You know what I mean? Was, <laughs> on his trumpet. But yeah, so he said, he said, oh, we should do something like this. And then what was crazy was, as you know, a lot of people were doing, they were just putting a recording up and then people sort of like miming to it. And it was like, well, we've got, we, it's about live music and we've all been about live music and the importance of live music. There's no way we're using the recording. So we sent the recording to people to play with so that we could get them playing yeah. in time to the music. I'll tell you this, 1400 people, there's no way that all of them played in time to the music or to the piece of music that we wanted but by god we got them all in there and you know that was sort of our right this is how we're going to edit together and we sat there in that room for two weeks because we wanted to get it made for ryan yeah and he started dying and started dying quick and like another thing he'd done as well was he phoned me one day and i thought we were going to chat about this this world band thing and he phoned me one day and he was in the top box and in the bottom box was the guy who was his stem cell donor and he oh phoned him up and said, oh, I've managed to get this guy. So I'm sitting there watching these two having a chat. 
where he's like, oh, yeah, I feel a little bit like you, actually, you know, because it's like I'm getting your DNA. So I'm saying, watch it. This is the game. We're not putting this in the film. We can't get this in the film. But just all that crazy, just wild stuff, you know? Yeah, that's, that is and, bonkers. <laughs> yeah, mate. Just just some of this stuff is just, just bonkers. But yeah, we got that together. Me, Luke, and Tara, we edited in that room. Luke was basically putting it all together in this in these boxes and everything like that. Meanwhile, I've got this. I've worked out how to structure this film and worked out how to do it the way we've done it. I'll talk about you whenever you want me to talk about that. I'll talk about that. But I've worked that out. So that's in my back burner, ready to go. Right. And I'm thinking, right, I, I in, in Ryan mindset, we're editing together this thing and Luke's finessing it. And Erica Brenner, who's also in the film, who's a Grammy winning classical music producer, multiple mm-hmm. actors. I think she's won two now. Right. She's uh, an amazing person we love it to bits she's doing a sound edit of these 1400 people oh my gosh <laughs> for free <laughs> for us just up there in cleveland so she's doing that and whilst that's all going on as i said i'm creating a like a powerpoint presentation or a keynote whatever you want to call it with literally taking shots taking little video clips taking music and listening to vivaldi like it's going out of fashion and i'm literally you know max richter and all that kind of stuff and literally just shaping this whole thing and then it's all there ready to go uh so when we'd finished doing this 1400 people and we literally do we put 1400 people on a screen all playing together all in sync all rhythmically somehow working tiny bit of auto tune on one or two of them because some of the sounds were organic right and some of the <laughs> some of the wallpaper went on off, we <laughs> went on yeah <laughs> going out loud we so you know we we did that and everybody now if we put it on a big screen will have I don't know. Like, I think it's one foot by one foot, each of them. So there's yeah. all these people. And so that was really cool. So whilst that was, once we'd done that, we'd had our arguments in the edit suite, we'd had our chats and we started immediately then on the film mm. and we edited it for like six months to eight months because we had time, you know, yeah. COVID was going on. We had no work. So yeah, I'd turn up to theirs every day or I'd stay overnight. We'd watch the Dodgers play baseball and just have a great time <laughs> editing this film together. Yeah. So you kind of talked about Ryan like never stopped, right? Kind of had yeah. that about himself. Uh, when did he uh, hike Mount Fuji? Because uh, that that in itself is difficult. So <laughs> I can't imagine. Yeah. So he was diagnosed in 2012. Mm-hmm. Uh, I met him in 2015. And I think he did Fuji in 2016 or 2017, wow. if, if memory Jeez. is correct. And the, and the crazy thing is when we got that footage, it was from like a, this group of people and they said, and the problem was it had music in the background of it. Um, <laughs> you had to strip the music. Which always happens. And they, <laughs> and obviously like they've, they've recorded over it because they were like, you know, this firm over in Japan and we're doing that multiple myeloma research mm-hmm. and that, and to cater oncology. And that was great, but it was like, right, now we've got music over it. So we have to be careful how we use the, the narrator, how we use our music in there, you know? Mm-hmm. And yeah. uh, what, you know, it wasn't just Amazing Grace. They'd put some kind of like, you know, pumping sort of gala night, you know, events video tune on it. So perfect. <laughs> because it was sad because that's another thing we had to cut because Ryan halfway up the mountain says something like he's like looks into the camera and he's got his chemotherapy drugs in his hand, taking them when he's like, oh, my know, gosh, three, two, how many thousand feet off from the from the summit? That's he's just wild. taking his chemo. <laughs> and the brilliant thing, the other thing we wanted to get in as well was. So um, Ryan and his doctor did a lot of things together. And there's a picture of him in the film with at Dave Matthews Band. Um, yes. They loved Dave Matthews Band. <laughs> the and DMB? The crazy thing. <laughs> yeah, the crazy th- Oh, mate, he's got it. Dr. Dr. Uh, Berryman, Brian Berryman, has got it on his folder. He's got like a picture of, of the thing and the logo <laughs> and everything. And when he met Ryan, Ryan told him he knew Rashawn Ross, which he did. Like Rashawn, Ryan knows every trumpet player in the world. Like on this on in cancer blows there's like some great stars that we couldn't even mention their connection but it was yeah. pretty well like jose cibaja's on there he is the trumpet player from ricky martin's living la vida de loca that's the trumpet <laughs> that's, that's so cool. him I was like, right? Damn, he's good. on it i've got i've got him on my speed now right he's that's amazing awesome. and he's one of the nicest guys he's trying to get us across to san, san sebastian international film festival in spain but he's on it so he's awesome Ooh. right and all these great, 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 great. I know that's another thing that you you get into trying to get trying to get people into the festivals to try and take note is tough when it's classical music. But heck, we're, we're doing our best. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I mean, I mean, uh, all these trumpet players that Ryan knew and all these people 
Ryan could easily connect you to any of them. You know what I mean? It yeah. was very easy for him to do it. He'd just put you on a group text. And before you know it, you've got like, why is Wycliffe Gordon's probably thinking, who's this Chris, eh? Who's this guy? <laughs> and he would just do it. There's one time, <laughs> Wayne, Wayne Bergeron's on there. Wayne Bergeron, if you ever go on his website, he's played on like 700 soundtracks. He's played on more soundtracks that you, you'll literally go through and think, I've heard this guy in all of these, right? Uh, so Wayne Bergeron's uh, like a big supporter of the band. He's given, uh, of the band, of the film. He's given us money to help us make it. Herb Alpert from the Tijuana Brass has helped us make it. Like, there's quite a few people who've really kind of invested in this film. But yeah, going back to Ryan and his doctor, they went to see... So Ryan's doctor was like, oh, I love Dave Matthews' band. You don't know the trumpet player is Sean Ross, do you? And Ryan's like, yeah, of course I do. Like, I'm a trumpet player and everybody knows me. So what was great was they got onto a WhatsApp group, the three of them. Yeah. And I really wanted to put into the film because apparently... Dr. Berryman, who's the sweetest, nicest guy, is very prolific, or was very prolific on this WhatsApp group. He was just like, hey, Rashawn, how's it going? You know, like, he's kind of fanboying <laughs> Rashawn yeah. Ross and the Dave Matthews band. And I just wanted to cut to Rashawn if we could have filmed him, uh, just go, like, Ryan and his doctor kind of having a bit of back and forth. And I wanted to just cut to Rashawn and him say something like, yeah, I've got Dr. Berryman on my speed dial. You know, whatever <laughs> like that, because yeah. just the way that he was just like hyping up this whole Doctor, uh, this whole Rashawn Ross. And I just imagine Rashawn was like, I've got to block this guy's number or something. <laughs> yeah, I thought it was, <laughs> yeah, it was great. And uh, I hope that, you know, as I said, uh, I hope that doesn't offend Berryman, but yeah, it was great. Their relationship was one of the nicest relationships I've ever seen. And, you know, it, it was that kind of thing. Yeah, go on. He was the guy that you were, um, there's a scene where you got... You're in the doctor's office, I think. Yeah. And I, I, th- yeah. I swear you said you were holding the boom mic. In I'm it? in the other room. Oh, okay. yeah. So that that's all for, that's all recorded on shotgun mics. But this is how crazy this was. So that was the first day in Dallas. We arrived in Dallas. Ryan had arrived two days before. In fact, not two days, one and a half days before. We were driving. Oh, I've not even told you guys how this all went. Right. <laughs> yeah. <Cracky. laughs> uh, you didn't that is, right. We were we driven from LA to Memphis to make oh, this. Oh God. We, we bought a, a trailer with the money that we got from crowdfunding. Mm. And we, and my old boss was Shane Hilbert. Uh, who's at ASC. He's a really good guy. And he gave us cameras and sound equipment and light and everything. He's, he's a hell nice. of a DP, DP. And he brought me over to LA. Actually, he's the reason I got here. And yeah, we filled up this, this trailer. We drove it to, to Memphis. Um, all of us and and yeah, we we basically just started filming and filming Ryan and capturing his life, capturing what he was doing, capturing what he was like. And that was really important. But when we got to Dallas, we drove there from Memphis to Dallas, arrived, and Ryan was like, right, I'm going into the doctors. He's gonna tell me, you know, what my blood results are like or what this is like, or what that's like. And uh, you know, it, it it was like everything's happening so fast, you know, and yeah. um and you can't really you can't really, really not say, you can't really say no to Ryan. And when you think about it, you know, like I, I was sitting there thinking, God, we, we could get in a lot of trouble for this. Like Ryan literally walked <laughs> us into the hospital. He's going to see his doctor. He's telling everybody that we are just like capturing home movies. I'm there with like a, a boom mic, you know, and a sound <laughs> pack. Ben's in front of me with his camera. Luke's in front of me with his camera. And the three of us are fly, flying around. Tara's back at home at the Tara's back at this house that we'd Airbnb, literally working out schedules for filming, working out, you know, yeah. trying to phone up, trying to sort out all the legalities of us even going into a hospital. And there we are, just filming away. Doing it. Ryan's going, this is, this capture is this. This is where I get weighed. This is where I get my blood taken. This is, and he's like, like, yeah, don't worry about filming these girls. They all love me. And like, like all the nurses are there smiling at camera and stuff. And we're like, and then this, what's worst is, so we went into that room with Ryan and his wife, Nikki. And obviously it's heartbreaking. You know, like, yeah. what is it? Um, you know, he's going to be told 70%, but we didn't know at that point. We just knew he's like, oh, I hope that my cancer cells are okay. I hope that I've got a low percentage. So they, Luke and, and Ben went into the room, the two camera people went into the room and sat down on, on like the far side of the room, which you can't really see, but they're on two little wheelie chairs. And I couldn't fit in the room because there was just no way. It was, it was made for like two people and there was yeah. like five in there. <laughs> so I went in the room next door and I'm sitting there and like there was a, we put a shotgun mic in there and stuff like that, but it was mostly recorded on the shotguns of the, of the cameras. And yeah, like uh, I'm sitting listening on my 
my sound pack and hearing all of that without seeing it it's all going in my ears a bit a bit like music i suppose and oh, yeah. as that's happening the woman who was the uh head of texas oncology or head of pr at Te- whatever it was you know very very nice lady afterwards but not at that point um she <laughs> marched in i'm hearing you know i'm hearing ryan's like got 70 percent so in one ear and then i've got her going who's your producer why have they not and all this and i'm sitting there like i couldn't i couldn't correlate it i couldn't get it all together and then yeah tara then phones i'm getting 50 missed calls from tara so we came out of that hospital and and yeah, we were not flavor of the month for a bit there. But, oh you know, no! No, was, no more returns that, to the hospital for a bit. <laughs> run and gun. No, but it was run and gun. And do you know what? For that bit, it was it was important because we wouldn't have caught that. And I think that maybe you know even even everything about it. it there's quite a poeticness about that that scene yeah. because Ryan was Ryan was going in honestly not feeling as bad as he had. He didn't feel great, but he was like, oh yeah, I've felt seventy percent and it's terrible. You know, you feel like this, you feel like that. And the problem was it would hit Ryan in various different ways Mm. Um, and he would be touring. So he can't go and have a blood transfusion. He can't go and have this, can't go and have that. So he's touring for four days. And when he comes out, he's bottomed out completely. Yeah. You know, and that was, yeah, that was just the way he was, man. He was just an inspiring guy. And the problem is when you're making films, sorry, I'm going off tangent, but but when you're making films, you know, like you have an idea for what you want it to be. And that was how I wrote it. I wrote it to be the story of Ryan Anthony. That's why it is Song for the Ryan Anthony story. Yep. Mm-hmm. And I think that the biggest uh, the biggest problem I was coming up against was every time I was kind of writing the story, I was telling people about the story and like that. Lots of people were saying, oh, what's your political angle? What's this angle? What's that angle? And it just annoyed the hell out of me. Because I was just like, is that what's going to get us into a Sundance? Is that what's going to get us into a South by having this political sort of, you know, wedging in a or crowbarring in a, a political thing just because you, you know, it has to it happen feels like it in documentaries to nowadays. Yeah. Yeah. It's it's not a great way of filmmaking, I don't think. I think that don't get me wrong, there's a lot of political messages need to be said, but they tend to be, you know, either very cleverly told, and that was their motive all along, yeah. which is great. You know what I mean? Uh, and then like a little bit like, and I don't know why I'm using this one because there's better documentary makers out there, but this one's a good one. Uh, it, a bit like Michael Moore in, in Fahrenheit 9-11, you know. Um, yeah. He did He did this bit where um, he showed, at the very beginning, the opening was just, the, it was people who were TV anchors or people who, who stand at sort of crime scenes and stuff, just having makeup put on, you know what I mean? And doing mm-hmm. their own makeup before the film, before the cameras start filming them, before they, they actually go on camera. And obviously the whole thing is about a cover up. The whole thing, is, and it, it's, I really like that. That's how, you know, a very subtle and very clever way to start. And then we'll learn about what the thing is. I find that sometimes there's there's films out there that 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 go right. This is the story, and it's about this person. But we know that biopics are not well treated at film festivals, and we won't get into South by if it's if it's a biopic. <laughs> so we need to crowbar some, you know. Oh, you know, right. it's it's Something actually spicy about this, you this subject. Spice. Yeah, yeah. That's it. It's actually about. So sometimes, I, yeah, I think that making the story that you want to tell. Is important because you're more passionate about it. You you yeah. believe in it. You believe sure. in the people that are in the stuff. You know. Ah, we've got my soapbox. Then you get your turn <laughs> yeah. beef, beef at film festival good, all good. over again, guys. <laughs> I was yeah. loving it there, man. Yeah. <laughs> I did. I went on a few riffs. <laughs> That's fine. Yeah, it's all good. Love listening to it. Thanks. So, how many festivals have you gotten into? Then, uh, I mean, are you struggling with that, or is it just kind no, of? No, I think. I think we're doing all right. We're in 10, I think, now. I mean, oh. Canada's got the whole... Yeah, it's pretty cool. So we're in Sarasota. We're in one in Barcelona, which is like the finals, because there's one that basically they do it monthly, and then they have like a yearly finals, and we're in the yearly final of this Ooh. one. It's ARF Barcelona, which is pretty cool, 2022. Then we're in Richmond, uh, Virginia, which is uh, a big, big international film festival. And, yeah, Sarasota is the one that's coming up in April. I'm trying to think Malibu as well is next week. That and one is virtual, right? Other one virtual yeah all virtual uh, those that one's virtual i'm gonna we're, we're gonna be going to the barcelona one virtually sadly i was hoping to take me my speedos oh, and get some tan <laughs> i know. love <laughs> mate well that was it I'm, and the thing is what's great is obviously now that it's it's winning or now it's doing well like people are all people are all diving on like the trips so it's like a circus is going to be coming to town now because i've got like like jens wants to come and play and he's like oh yeah i've spoken to the ritz whatever in sarasota and i'm going to play a little gig with this piano player that i'm bringing along with me and it's like people are just coming just to hang out for the festival and just sort of doing some music 
gigs and stuff. Um, there's another one. Um, when when we got to Richmond, Virginia, Pete Meekin, who's the guy who actually wrote Song of Hope, the, the original, the one that Ryan played, yeah, the one okay. that's played on by the 1,400 people, he's coming down because he's got a new premiere um, for the American Bandmaster Association in Virginia, in Richmond. So he's like, oh, I'll come along and just hang out at the festival. So that's yeah, awesome. he's getting me around the States, actually. It's quite nice. You know, all these musicians are all sort of coming out. So yeah, it should be good. Is, uh, so yeah. is Ryan's wife, Nikki, going to go to many more festivals? I was honestly just oh, yeah. like in shock when she was there. At Beth. <laughs> oh, She's a riot. I mean, Nikki, yeah, Nikki doesn't let a lot of people in easily, but when she does, she's the best person she really is and Aww. yeah you see it in the film I, we had to capture it in a way and i think that i listened to tony's music from another film called uh Raft dubs over broadway um which was like a while ago tony tony by the way is a composer he's cool as hell um he was actually um uh, he was writing sort of the trailer music at skywalker yeah. ranch for like uh, oh for uh, uh, forrest gump and uh um, Iron Giant and a few nice. other like like big yeah big films he did a bunch of stuff and um, yeah when uh, w- when Ryan introduced me to him actually was like this guy Tony's great he's written this piece he wrote the music for uh, NBC Monday Night Football right and I was like what and it was like yeah this guy's written 140 licks for Monday Night Football the whole all that Tony wrote it all and then they recorded it for NBC right in the back in the day it's I imagine it's changed all now and everything like that but. So Tony did all that. So I was like, oh, this is cool, but it's not really the vibe I'm going for, to be honest, right? I want it to be more musically structured. You know, this goes, no, mate, this guy, like, learned, you know, the greats, the John Williams and everything. He worked at Skywalker Ranch. He did all this stuff for trailers. So, yeah, then whilst Ryan was still alive, I was chatting to Tony and talking about these ideas. And, you know, yeah. we, we were kind of sitting chatting. And it was what was crazy was Ryan, yeah, I, I spoke to Ryan a bit. I kind of wanted Ryan to know as much as possible in a way because – you don't you know he's gonna he's gonna pass you know yeah. i think that we, we kind of reached that point so i didn't know when that was gonna happen so i sent him my, my powerpoint that was 80 pages long and you can have a look at minute by minute of his life and as i said with that it wasn't that i knew he was gonna die with that the plan was we finished the movie here because every day when i knew ryan we he said to me from the first day i met him oh i just have to make it to my daughter's graduation that was yep. his whole thing with me. Now, he might have had different things with other people, but for me, he thought, he said, no, man, they told me that, you know, I was going to die in six to 12 months. And I went, no, my goal, daughter's graduation. Yeah. And people looked at him crazily, but he was like, why would I set myself a goal six months from now? Because when I make it, uh, then I've got to set a new goal. I'd rather set one big goal. You yeah. know what I mean? And as I said, heartbreakingly, he didn't make it, but that wasn't the point. And I think that's right. why we kept, you know, we kept Berryman in there saying Ryan's going to die because... That was the realization for me, really. It's not about death, you know, because yeah. when you get, you know, when you get told that you've got incurable cancer, if you think about the death, you're not going to do anything with what's left of your life. You know, yeah. and that was the crazy thing we ran. He was told that he was never going to really be cured from it. And he just yeah, decided it's... not to accept that and keep doing stuff until, <laughs> you know, yeah. it, it was it was more universally non-accepted. You know, yeah. I and then I actually had a question about the Buford Film Festival. So when you got so when oh, you guys shoot, won. Sorry. No, it's all good. When mm-hmm. you won the, uh, it was the best documentary feature, right? Mm-hmm. I oh, swear, yeah. best documentary I, feature and best music score. Very awesome. I swear, I saw Thanks. either you or Luke gesture like, like was it to like Philippe from um the long um shit? What's it called? Oh, um, the long red. I yeah, spoke like, to Philippe. Right. Did you try and like say like was there like a side bet for his hat going on or something? <laughs> no, right. This is great. So <laughs> Philippe, Philippe had spoken to us earlier in the week. Right, we'd gone to this sort of like a filmmaker wine and cheese, whatever. Oh, the hell yeah, yeah, right? yeah. I saw and the. I saw it the was pictures. nice. Up at, some, up at some Culver House or something. Oh, well, I, I, it, again, I was walking through, and then they wanted a picture taken. And everything. I didn't manage to speak to a lot of people, you know, like. But Felipe was there. I had a good chat to him. I didn't manage to speak to Metal, um, but I saw her film. There was a few people that I really wanted to kind of chat to about their films because I'm a bit of a film geek. In case you haven't noticed, so <laughs> I was really kind of. I've I've met a couple since. I met uh, you know I met Robbie out here who did did one called American Morning. He's cool, right? But yeah, uh, there's you know. I, I, I really wanted to kind of get to hang out with those people at the uh, 
at the the wine cheese thing it was. And Felipe <laughs> was yeah. yeah. Felipe was cool as hell. He was uh, you know he was standing there in this hat, and I was like, dude, I really like your hat. I, like <laughs> you need you need to get me one with like a British flag on. And he was like, oh, a British flag on top. And I was like, nah, you know, after Brexit, I'm not the biggest fan of Britain right now. So let's go for something a bit more cool. <laughs> So I don't know what flag I'll get, but yeah. So that he was like, he was like, yeah, I'll sort you out, bro. And I thought he said that, he, well, at that same event, he said he'd come to watch our film, right? Because we said, oh, we'll come and watch your film. You can watch it. It's quite a nice thing. Mate, I'll tell you this. We were there on that Saturday night or whatever. We turned up, we went and sat down on our Q&A and everything. Oh, so before before the film even showed, and I watched Felipe and uh, and and Sean and all that leave. So I was like, oh, oh man, got it. <laughs> yeah. So then what was great was on the night of the gala event, I went over and went, where were you? And he went, oh, don't worry, I'll still sort your hat out, bro. And I went, hey, don't give me any of that. I went, I don't believe you, I don't believe you. <laughs> so I went up on stage, I thought, Call him out, and there's no doubt I'm going to get my hat. You know, yeah. So that's what yeah. Okay, so that's what that was about. <laughs> that was it, but in a nice way. Because right, yeah. I've chatted a lot since. He's a really nice guy. I know a yeah. bit about horses and stuff, which is cool. So me and him have chatted. You know, I sent him a few emails of people that I know that might, you know, he might be getting in with in a in a cool yeah. horse sense. And but yeah, it was like we we had a bit of a joke about the hat. And heck, I'll send him a headband or something. One of my things, maybe a hat, maybe a cap, I don't know, something like that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> During that, you'll see us in like some of the pictures. Sam and I were like uh, probably third row the entire week. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. I moved around. I like being in the back corner, but I moved around. It was quite nice, you know. It was yeah, a really nice hall. I swear. At one point, so I'm pretty sure I heard you ask a question once because I was like, I have not, because like I have a mm. decent memory. <laughs> I think the other two can agree to that, but I, I'm gonna speak for them there. <laughs> I was like, I don't recognize this guy's yeah. voice. What the hell? What movie? Is oh this yeah, guy in? the British. <laughs> The, the British, British accent sort of gives it away, doesn't it? Yeah. yeah. Well, the thing was, yeah. Well, just before, just before we won the documentary prize, like this other guy got up who was like a proper cockney, like, "Oh, hey, how's it going?" That? And I was like, I, "I don't know if it's documentary short or best short film or something," but he got up and he was like, "Proper, oh, hey, how's it going?" And I was thinking, God, they're gonna think, you know, if we win, then they're gonna think that it's all British and like it's some kind of, you know, oh, like, shoot, a, I know a, like some kind of Bridget and fest. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I remember. So uh, that, I don't remember what was his movie. I don't know. I don't know, but it won. But that was it. So I was just like, okay, right. Well, you know, don't talk too much and don't be too British. And then <laughs> thankfully Tara had written some words down because I didn't, in case you didn't notice. And then, yeah, I think when I started riffing about Philippe's hat, I was like, oh, oh my God, this I'm one, a, this I'm one a, certainly went off. Quick. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> And if you notice, that's what I did. I was like, oh, yeah, God, we've got to do a nice dedication to Luke's mom, which was beautiful. You know, really nice dedication and everything, but yeah. crying out loud. <laughs> right after I've been sort of calling Felipe out on his hat. So, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it happens, guys. Oh, They're yeah. doing best musical score. So Yeah, and I was sending Tony up for that because he was like, Chris, come up with me. But I didn't. I thought that was Tony's moment. Yeah, yeah. I would agree. For, yeah, For him to win stuff like that. And my word, you know, what a, what a score his score is. Yeah. Sorry, go on. <laughs> We we didn't act, so we actually had the choice of either sponsoring the musical score or comedy. We ended up going with comedy, but we're, oh, we're almost, so you we're yeah, in the pamphlet. Got, Flipper it? Flicks is in the pamphlet. If you go and <laughs> oh, look yeah, at nice, it. I'll give it a glance. You guys did uh, so it's reopening one that one, didn't it? Yeah, reopening. Yeah. We actually have talked to Chris, the other Chris, yeah, <laughs> another Chris, yeah, no, and Kelsey from over here as well in LA. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so well, you teased. Yeah, a no relation. No relation. No. <laughs> Thanks for yeah. clearing that up. <laughs> I wasn't sure. I wasn't sure there. <laughs> I was going to say you teased Tony and um, Ryan's relationship a little bit. So what was it more of like they they like fully knew each other or was that just another person that like yeah. Ryan had on speed dial and like no. had his connections? <laughs> Uh, Tony and Ryan were were very close, um, really close, actually. It's a strange one. They played for like a few brass ensembles. I think one of them was called Burning River Brass. You know, all these brass ensembles have really cool names just to, yeah. you know, just to kind of ent entice people. So they were called Burning River Brass. And I think that if I remember correctly, Ryan went to Memphis and was sort of, you know, living out of his car, like he said, and living at Gary's and things like that. Yeah. And then Tony went, Tony was up in Salt Lake City and got diagnosed with lung cancer. Oh. oh man! And then, yeah, right. So that took a turn. And then, <laughs> so Ryan then flew. I know, sorry, guys. Don't worry. We'll bring it back because he's still with us. I don't know if you noticed, right? But then, so then Ryan flew. Ryan flew from Memphis to live with Tony whilst he fought it. And Tony actually had the the 
the and I'm not sure how big it was. Ryan over exaggerates and says it was a volleyball size, but he took they took it out. They took his lung out with the tumor in it. And now oh, Tony shit. plays trumpet unbelievably and played on this soundtrack with one lung and played wow. trumpet. And he's the principal trumpet of Seattle Symphony Orchestra. And so I yeah, can't even not, play a trumpet with two lungs. <laughs> wild, right? I know. <laughs> it's wild. It's bad. And so he's playing the Ryan theme, actually. That's the in the oh, cool. da, 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 da. that's 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 Tony. It was the first thing that he recorded on that weekend up in Seattle. So that was <laughs> that's a really cool thing. And it's nice that he's playing that. And yeah, they were really close. I mean, Ryan even asked Tony to be his best man at his wedding that was in Damn. with to Nikki in Memphis. I don't know what happened. I don't know whether Tony got a gig. I don't know, but Tony wasn't there. Not that he wasn't there for his bait or anything like that, but Tony didn't make it. Uh, so he, he didn't manage to be best man at Ryan's wedding. But I tease him on that because mm. me, him and Ryan had a few phone calls together where I was like, well, make sure you turn up this time, Tony, and all this kind of stuff, you know. So <laughs> they, they buried that hatchet and plus Ryan got him this gig. So clearly the hatchet is well and truly better. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Low hanging fruit, yeah. easy, easy to poke at. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> oh yeah, but they were great. I mean, Tony it is. It, you know what? The the brilliant thing about Tony writing this music was he knew Ryan. He knew the cancer fight. He knew the power of music. Yeah. He knew how composition could be affected. And the cool thing was, we just sat and I chatted to him about. Look, I wanted to be like this, and I found like when we did the original edit. I found like playlist of the music and the style of the music. And then Tony goes, right, I've got that. Now I'm going to go off and I'm going to do my thing. I'm going to try and create these established and great scores and sound scapes and things like that. So that's how we did it. So, you know, when Nikki's doing the, um, the diagnosis, I really like this, this kind of and real kind of, you know, metronomic um, uh, pacing. You know what I mean? To really kind of add that dum dilly dum dilly dum dilly dum dum that that that's actually Tony's wife, Mika on cello. And I wanted that to be higher pitched. And Tony was like, no, let's get this into a cello and let's do like a thing. So yeah, so that piece came originally from Real Roger Roger Gula's Pale Blue Dot, which is a violin piece, which is very kind of arpeggio. And yeah, we when when we got the cello in there and that real kind of digging down right towards the end. It was like, you know, pretty powerful stuff. And it did exactly what we needed it to do. Because yeah. when you're structuring this, when you're pacing this, you know, it, it's that idea of um, somebody said it once, death's like a symphony, fast, slow, fast. You know what I mean? Mm. You get the diagnosis and it's quick. It's all going at super pace and you don't know your life's not really going to kind of settle down really. And then all of a sudden it has to settle because you don't know what's going to happen next. There's the slow yeah. movement of that second act that slowly gets faster and faster. And then that final one is just a dance to the end, really. You know, we know yeah. he's going to die, but it doesn't matter, really. Pace has got to go, you know? Definitely. Yeah. Um, well, I was just kind of curious, I guess, uh, when when the soundtrack might be out for listeners or be on oh. Spotify or... Yeah, we've got a few people ask about that. I listen to movie soundtracks at <laughs> work, like, every day. <laughs> yeah, I'm a geek. I'm a proper geek of, of it. And the crazy thing was, right before Beaufort, they had a private showing out down at um, oh. just a quiet one in, in not like a world premiere. It was a private one for, for students in Bournemouth. I wanted to be in England. I wanted to, them to experience this one. And more importantly than that, it was a festival run by Rupert Gregson-Williams, who's the Emmy-winning composer, not Harry Gregson-Williams, who did all the um, some of the harry potter stuff mm. um but yeah Ru rupert gregson williams and rachel portman did a talk right after our film who did and you guys you know like she did a lot of good ones but strangely uh i'm gonna say a movie now that you guys probably haven't thought about in terms of its music soundtrack but the legend of bag of vance with matt damon and will smith in it from, okay. from i don't know 2001 okay. <laughs> yeah yeah her score her score in that if you ever type it in there's a great tune in called juna plays the field it's about number seven on the soundtrack i listened to that on repeat it was just a beautiful piece of music just so so fragile almost and it's such a great piece of music and yeah like i was obsessed with her as a composer since then and yeah she did a talk after this film not back there so yeah, cool. I don't know where I went on a tangent there, but yeah, film <laughs> composers. That's where I was going. That's where the tangent. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, film, I brought it film, up. I brought it yeah. up. I'm the one who, I, I, film, I film, us. <laughs> well, film composers do this, don't they? Don't they? And, and and I'm really fascinated by them, just like you guys are. It's like one of the coolest things. Oh, I, I just love I love listening to soundtracks. You know, listening mm -hmm. to the John Williams that was 90 minutes to oh, 120 yeah. minute soundtracks. You know, like they didn't. And and I've said to Tony, like, we've got a few ideas for stuff we can do in the future. You know, there's more narrative stuff. And it's just 
you know, really is cool when you can play with like an original soundtrack. You're creating stuff that people are going to listen to for for years to come. You know, yeah. Um, and what's even cooler with this is we've spoken to the DSO recently and uh, the Dallas Symphony Orchestra, Ryan's Orchestra. Oh, okay, I was like, I don't know what that the, is. The, I'm be oh, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> the, 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 I could have. Just, I'll throw some. I, there was a BMW. There was that. No. Uh, and and yeah, we we uh, but we did a yeah we were supposed to the DSO the. Other, uh, you know, not long ago, and the plan is obviously for Cancer Blows, which is Ryan's charity, we'll start doing live performances with orchestras. Like, we'll make this score available for orchestras and ensembles to play. Nice. Like, back in the UK, as I said, I played at Brass, I played on Brass Off uh, live, which was like, you know, brass bands uh, doing. Uh, doing doing the music for Brass Off with this massive screen and everything, and it was done down at the Royal Albert Hall, and it was just really cool. All these things, and you've seen it with Jurassic Park being played live with an yeah. orchestra, and Star Wars live with an orchestra. Why can't we do it with a with a documentary? And why can't it be a, you know do it with this, whereby the structure is yeah. so integral in music, and not just that. Ryan is interwoven into this soundtrack. You know, we actually take points where Ryan's playing and rips off a note and stuff, and put it into the score. So it, it's like he's playing on his own soundtrack, I suppose, which is cool because then Ryan gets to play on Infinitely. stages all over the world for yeah, he'll never yeah. he'll outlive us all, I suppose. So that's that's the really cool thing about it. Yeah, that's very cool. Yeah. <laughs> um, can you kind of tell us a little bit more about Cancer Blows? Yeah. So Cancer Blows started in 2015. Ryan was uh, uh, in fact maybe they wanted to start it before that, but I think Cancer Blows was in 2015 was the first one. So Ryan got diagnosed in 2012 and basically multiplied myeloma and the, the, the version of multiple myeloma that Ryan had, the, the strain of it was yeah. particularly aggressive and there was nothing on the market. There was no real drugs out there to help, you know, because it's a terminal cancer. So what you get is you get people going on certain types of medication, certain chemos and certain things like that. And then they'll reach the end of what they can get anymore or their bodies won't be able to take it anymore. Now, usually the latter is the thing that happens first. Their bodies can't take any of that, you know, the chemo and the radiation and all that kind of stuff, and they, they sadly pass away. Because Ryan was so young, his body could take quite a lot of that, that chemo, quite a lot of punching, yeah. quite a lot of, you know, radiating. And, yeah, so, so Ryan got diagnosed in 2012, and I think that there was just so little on the market for him. So the plan was, right, well, I, I'm gonna, I've been given, you know, six to 12 months and at best one to three years was what they were giving him. So mm -hmm. they were like, you know, Ryan was like, that's based on the drugs that are out there. And that's based on how well this cancer is known, which is not very right now. Yeah. yeah. So, and it still isn't. So he went out there and they created, and he and Jens, you know, trouble together. It was Jens is in, in Cancer Blows as well. They're trouble. They always, you know, they come up with these grandiose ideas, blah, 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 blah. And then they <laughs> phone up Nikki and Nikki goes, no way, right? Or <laughs> she's like, the, she's like the, too much money. Uh, or... <laughs> I mean, can you imagine what, Ryan, what it was like when Ryan phoned up and went, they're going to make a film about me and it's Chris and Jens is executive producer. I imagine Nikki <laughs> threw the phone into that lake. <laughs> but yeah, thankfully they trusted me, but yeah, um, yeah. Uh, where, where, where was I going? This what was the question again. I've Just um, tell us I, more I about cancer blows. blows. Oh yeah, so cancer blows. Sorry, I got too much on me. You're good. Uh, yeah, <laughs> you, got, so, you got the so beginning they, of it. Yeah, so, you yeah. notice how I lost it. Yeah, so cancer blows was exactly that. It was that thing of right. Let's get. I've got lots of friends who are fantastic, really famous trumpet players. I've got this roller deck. <laughs> Only a few of, of them. Right? <laughs> yeah. Lee Lock name for the well, exactly Lee Lock name from the band Chicago. I've got this person. I've got this person. Right. And that's what Yen, that's what Ryan and Jens were doing. They were just saying, who can we get next? Who can we get next? Who can we get next? Right. Who can we get? And you know, they got to Doc Severinsen, who is probably one of the most famous because of TV and because of everything like that. Um, and was having a film made at the same time. Uh Doc pretty much said, yeah, I'll do it. I'll come along and I'll be with you and I'll I'll play on stage with you again and all that stuff. And then from there, everybody you're speaking to who's a top trumpet player is is going to say yes because they want to play with Doc and they want to play with Ryan. Yeah. And they don't yeah. know how long Ryan's got. And the cool thing with that was, was Doc and Ryan were just awesome people to be around. I didn't make it to Kansas Bulls. It was the thing. I met Ryan right after it because that cancer blows, I think, was in March. I met Ryan oh. yeah, June, June, July. So I wasn't even there, but I heard about this and I heard about it from across the water. And I was like, I'm about to meet the guy that's died this, this, you know. And and as I said, it was just quite the journey after that. You know, it was yeah. like 
Cancer Blows 2 came about and then Ryan was like, right now we've done Cancer Blows 2, we can do this, we can do this, we can do this. And then you have Nikki behind him going, let's cut that down to three things, you know. But he <laughs> yeah, just did it. Let's just... roll it back a little bit. <laughs> he's, he's, you know, she's still doing, she, she's got two more albums of his. They've got music for two more albums. Yeah. Um, so th- th- yeah, so it, there's going to be a Ryan Anthony album next year and there's going to be another That's one, awesome. I don't know, in another year after that. And it's like, Aww. Nikki's still got those produced. And the crazy thing for me was... Um, I saw Nikki for Ryan's memorial, like literally the week after, four or five days after the, after Ryan had passed. And she was like, he was laying there, you know, the day before he passed and was literally coming up with all these ideas for how he wanted his funeral to go. And, and yeah, Aww. Jens will take a five minute spot there. And then we'll have uh, Wayne Bergeron could come and do a spot and he can play this one and we can have night in tune. Is he? And apparently he came up with all these ideas the day before he died. And Nikki was like, arguing with him saying i'm not doing all of this i'm not you know it's not, a, it's yeah. not like live aid or anything like right. that you know what i mean and uh, but that was just the way he was and as i said in terms of cancer blows uh becoming a thing he was the force of will that made it happen yeah and 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 whenever you kind of i got whenever i got kind of it, this got difficult and hard you know um i would always look at his his, his model and his path that he'd laid because this is a guy who is literally sitting there and sending the emails whilst you know you're sitting watching tv or something he won't stop and if he doesn't stop then we can so it was it, as i said that was quite a an education for me and yeah cancer blows as a result of that and nikki won't let it stop you know what's great yeah. is this film's now going to bring them attention and by yeah, bringing sure. them attention hopefully it becomes a global thing. You know? mm-hmm. The coolest one, oh, one of the coolest ones for me is Mike Lovett. Mike Lovett's a trumpet player from England, from London. Session musician, played in a bunch of, uh, played on the James Bond soundtracks. Really cool guy. Nice. He played on all the family guy, you know, the, the, <laughs> yeah. the theme, yeah, all yeah, the yeah. family guy <laughs> live. It's absolutely amazing. And he's like, yeah, yeah. Oh, I love Ryan. Yeah, let's get, this. let's do something. Yeah, it's, <laughs> it's absolutely bonkers, some of the stuff, you know. Wow. And then yeah. this guy who, this guy who does, um, you know, did comedy in a blonde wig somehow seems to be the guy telling the story. Yeah, so. Exactly. Yeah. That's just Talk how things work, you know? Yeah. Uh, but you didn't expect that sentence today, right? That was a, a new one. I don't know if I was. But here, I'll make a quick plug for this. Like, if you go to, like, smile.amazon.com, you can actually, you can choose to donate part of your purchase if you're using Amazon to the Ryan Anthony Foundation, which is very great to be able to do. Yeah. Yeah. So. Oh, that's fantastic. Yeah. Oh, thanks for that. <laughs> yeah, no problem. Um, yeah, it's something that I always forget to do is use smile.amazon. Yeah. And it, because some days I'm just like, I don't want to use Amazon. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, but anyways, I'll let Sam ask her question. She's been well, it sounds like you have so many good moments <laughs> yeah. from making the film, but I was gonna say, yeah. do you have like a favorite one that you haven't told us yet? <laughs> oh, oh man, there's some just daft one. like there was one that was um so there's a there's a great one i think we kept it all in the montage uh when with the when the saints and the you know when it gets faster and it's ryan and jens are both sitting in this like tiny little cupboard of a of a dressing room backstage okay and ryan ryan's completely bald because once he did the chemo it all started falling out all over the place yeah and then oh even crazier than that just a quick side note when <laughs> when ryan did when ryan did um stem cell it yeah. made his hair grow back curly and oh. like all kinds of crazy stuff because you're getting the dna of somebody yeah, else yeah yeah, so yeah. If, i remember if, and they're like wild things if you didn't like if, if they didn't like strawberries then no you, no yeah you wouldn't <laughs> like the taste of strawberries that's crazy is that oh so most goodness. of that conversation between ryan and his stem cell donor was him going and i tell you what i don't like dark chocolate anymore and he was like i'm no. sitting there going, I mean, is this gonna be that conversation <laughs> this is yeah, an interesting no. one. <laughs> when they were it's mad they were in the so they were in this this little cupboard of a of a cloak of a, of a dressing room backstage in austin and I didn't want to be on camera, obviously, and I had <laughs> I, I wanted to kind of have the boom. So I stood in the bathroom, literally like on the toilet, holding this boom out to capture them talking. I know, and, and unbelievably, the sound didn't make it in. And yeah, I just remember that. And Ryan's taking pictures of me on his phone. He couldn't hold himself together. So, you know, whatever you're filming is just him mucking around. So them laughing on that bit is them laughing at me being stuck in the box like trying to you know with which doesn't have a, a closable lid with a flat thing on it so i'm literally you know as i said dicing with that. <laughs> yeah with nice. wires i mean like sound wires nice. can you imagine it? i could not be it 
Oh, so, uh, yeah. yeah. So whilst that was happening, Ryan was taking pictures of me, uh, yeah, in the bathroom, possibly getting electrocuted. So yeah, good was, stuff. As I said, it's great. It's great photos. Um, <laughs> your wife is gonna great probably, experience. Like, has like yeah. printed out photos of those. Just be like, you remember this? Oh. <laughs> it was. There was a lot of crazy. As I said, just. It, it, it was a really nice experience to make this film because I got to hang out with a guy who's my friend. I mean, it probably translates a lot into the into the film and is, you know, it's not meaning to be sycophantic, but he was a great guy. And I, I think that what was really nice, you know, was was in that time together, you know, everybody was wanting to come and say what they thought of him and, and what yeah. he'd done for them. And you just couldn't fit them all in, you know. Yeah. And that's gonna, that's fine. They can tell their cut. stories everywhere. You know? Yeah. <laughs> Hey guys, let's chat about Anchor, shall we? Anchor is the easiest way to make a podcast. It's free and allows you to record with friends and edit your podcast right on your phone or computer. What's even better is that Anchor will distribute your podcast for you. This was such a huge plus for us since we know nothing about that sort of thing. Another perk we love about Anchor is that it will allow you to make money with no minimum listenership. Again, a huge win. Anchor makes creating and managing a podcast so easy since it's all in one place. Download the free Anchor app or go to anchor.fm to get started. Yeah. Outside outside of other festivals, um, what, what is next on your plate? Oh, I, so I write a lot and, and, and I really want to uh, get into some scripted stuff now. I've written a couple of scripts. Um, okay. okay. With, my, with my writing partner that's up in Chicago, uh, Mike, who's also an Englishman from Rochdale, same as me. He'll be on the bridge uh, cooperation. Um, perfect perfect and, uh, good good yeah <laughs> he won't be going to the town hall though they're taking that down um <laughs> let's get for putin uh but yeah i mean uh yeah he was a fan of it no uh it's i'm, I'm we're writing a sitcom right now so that's good i mean nice. I'm, I'm pretty far on with that which is cool and yeah there's a few others like it's nice chatting to like uh tony about ideas too because obviously now that we've used music as a kind of narrative tool in this one I've got so many ideas for what, we, how we can use that again and how we can use that in a, you know, in less of a kind of a documentary fashion, but certainly using it more in a, in a, in a narrative feel, you know, cause there's, there's so much with music structure. There's so much with narrative structure. And I think that that's the sad thing right now. Uh, it, there's a lot of films that, that don't really seem to have cool structures about them or anything like that. And then when you see one like a Nolan film or a Guillermo del Toro or a Greta Gerwig or, you know, Ava DuVernay's, they're really, really well-structured films. And those are the ones that stand out. You know, those are the directors that stand out. Those are the ones that I admire the most. Shaka yeah. King as well is great. Uh, because, <laughs> you know, just because I, I really like the way that they dance around structure. They're cool. Yeah. You know? So which filmmaker, if you could work with any of them, which one would it be? Oh, <laughs> That'd hardest question ever i know it's an insanely hard one. i know it's it's to- my wife done a win. Boom. That was perfect, <laughs> perfect my, wife, my wife's a producer on a tv show called the goldbergs that's, oh, uh, that's okay. Only okay yeah so so yeah if i can work with any filmmaker it'd be her definitely perfect oh, awesome. perfect answer yeah and prevent you know provided she don't start giving me shit on set or anything because then yeah, 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 yeah. Know, different story i have yeah. to change but i'll come back i'll give you another three hours and yeah i'll tell, I'll tell you about have you yeah, changed my name? No, go on. <laughs> have you um, been preferring to do like the writing part rather than the directing? Is that something like I don't know? So I'm not into the film. Yeah. I'm not in the film industry, it's... so I'm curious about. No, it. I'm film curious. I'd say, <laughs> I'd say everybody can write. Everybody can write films. And and what I did, and this was a, like when I came to LA, you know, uh, I, I came out to work for Shane. If you mm-hmm. want to edit this thing, he's a fantastic uh, uh, DP and uh, yeah, he worked on semi pro, really cool guy. Yeah, he did. Shane was awesome. <laughs> and he taught me, you know, blocking and lighting and things like that because I was writing for him. So I was learning from him and then putting it into, oh, nice. you know, not layman's, but simple terms for his filmmakers academy or every, his name of his, his, his company is. So I was doing that, but I was also doing analysis of films. So if you go to Hilbert Academy, I think it's called, but it's now Filmmakers Academy, I did a series of six episodes 10 minute episodes called the look of right and the idea was it was looking at the cinematography and the way that modern oh, top really quality modern films are, are directed so we did 1917 we did joker Ooh, did um uh, parasite and looked at how directors did it and what they did and the way that they framed people in the in the 
in you know the way they frame people i don't know why yeah. I was going, you know and, <laughs> and things like that if you look at it it's quite cool because that was something i did in england as well i moved up from from teaching english and stuff like that i actually ended up teaching film studies so that was one of the coolest things because literally nice. film studies yeah. film studies in the uk was like right we're going to watch this film called alien for suspense so i'll keep <laughs> pausing it every five minutes and we'll talk about how it's been and oh, that was no, literally how me and this so other guy alien. talked <laughs> it was amazing we got kids like you were getting kids going out with ipads and they were just filming sort of like like chase scenes and stuff you know, oh. like, right let's analyze it it was just cool and i love doing that and yeah as a, like i did these analyses in the same way that that we would do that back, back with my kids in school we would do these video analyses and things like that so i did that but at a much higher sort of rate shane was yeah. sort of paying a lot more money for him so yeah if you go on <laughs> and there's some really cool editing for him and yeah, we did that. It's not my voice talking about him because nobody will listen to this guy talking like this. So we got a really sort of a, a nice American voice. To, uh... <laughs> Sorry to bother you, style, too. right? Yeah. Yeah, exactly like that. So he does a, he does Patton that. Oswald. Yeah, we, we, <laughs> we've managed to, yeah, we've managed to not get anybody uh, copywriting the film or kicking off right now because it seems to be educational. So that's good. But yeah, give that a look. There's some really cool ones. I think we did The Lighthouse. Yeah, yeah oh, some, some good ones. and. Oh, the Irishman as well. We looked at how they shot that and mm, looked at the different yeah. camera types. And the cool thing was, because you're working, as I said, I was working in, in LA, but with a guy who's like a serious filmmaker, you're around cameras, you're around lights, you're around all that all day. So I'm learning all that whilst I'm there, you know? But yeah, where do I get back to? The filmmaker that I went with my wife, back to that one. Done. <laughs> well done. Nice. It. Keep saying that. Yeah, because she's just got home, so I'm making sure that she hears that. She hears that. Yeah, yeah ever. exactly. <laughs> Earning yeah. earning points. So, sure. <laughs> yeah. The cool thing, the poster, I mean the posters for the film, if you want to know about this one. So the guy who designed that is a is a is a really cool guy called Yarun Dewal, who works for BL Tomato, who design all these great posters in a, in in Hollywood, right? They do they did like Black Widow, they did I'm sure they did the new Spider-Man one. They do they do all great posters. And uh, he's you know, friends of, of myself, my wife, and he's Dutch. And I was talking to him about Man United and about, you know, because I'm a football fan from England. So I was talking to him about Dutch footballers and everything like this. And me <laughs> and him got an house like fire. And and when we needed a poster, I just kind of asked him and showed him a picture, showed him the film. And yeah, he made those did he, for us. Did he end up doing the, um, I think it's it's red, with yeah. it's kind of like a silhouette. Yeah, it's the Sol Bass inspired one because I love Sol Bass posters. Oh, okay. Sol Bass did The Shining and did a bunch of stuff for Kubrick. Not yeah. that I'm comparing myself to Kubrick, but he did all those. And then we've got another two, which are really cool, which I'll send you over because they're just as cool. But those are in case we were to get it distributed in, you know, like a Disney or a Hulu or something like this. And he did them in styles. So we've nice. got one, which is like a really cool arty one. And then there's another one which has got Fuji out of one of the windows that's behind him, like the hospital windows. And then on the other side is Dallas that he's playing towards. And it looks really cool. So if you imagine that red one with the silhouette, it's like that, but with stuff in the background. Nice. In the hospital windows and everything. Yeah, it's yeah. cool. So he did those and everything with this film has just been that. Just everybody kind of helping out, coming in, doing stuff, you know. The animation. I mean, that animation was cool because I, I did that. I'm not sure if I said this one on stage, but there's an opening animation, which is basically the I beginning of the I loved that, music, by the right? way. The, the graphic. Oh, like that? Yeah, I really liked yeah. it. Oh, cool. Well, that the idea with that was I'd written it because the whole thing, as I said, being a symphony and then the whole film technically being like the old music concerts, you know, yep. where you would turn up and you would hear them warming up and then you'd hear them go into these tuning notes and then start playing. From there, you go into what's called an overture where you hear the themes of the opera or of the symphony that you're going to hear. Like if you ever watch, um, the, I don't know, there's the Thievish Magpie, there's the Bat, there's all these different overtures that would be played by the orchestra. And the idea of that was, hey, we know you're not going to listen to this for the next hour and 20 minutes, and we know you're not going to pick out all these themes, so here's a quick trailer of the themes so you can recognize them musically for when we go into the actual main symphony. So that's nice. what we did visually and with music and with joy from Apollo 100 uh, Satellite Orchestra. We, we did... Um, we did that animation to show music coming to life, but also to show these themes of, you know, Ryan being this musician and a top musician, but also showing the cancer fight and the family and him not giving up in the face of, you know, laughing in the face of cancer, I suppose we tried to do. So yeah, that all kind of interwove itself into the music. And then to do that, um, I was sitting with Luke and Tara in the office and I just said, I want to show music coming to life. Um, and I have this idea and they grabbed me a, uh, 
uh, uh, some paper and I just said I, I, I was I don't know I think I was trying to be an artist I might have been I know, <laughs> might have been in a zone but I got this paper towel and just sort of rolled it out and then drew the line and then drew the heartbeat from the line as if music is coming to life and then we go into a sound wave which is easy to draw just scribbling and then I started drawing manuscript music because I said I'd done that I studied it I knew how to play music and just wrote out the whole theme joy by back and then when I got home, I'd rolled it round the house with put stickers on it, uh, put stickers yeah. on it, stuck pictures on it. And then I'm walking around the house to the tune and pausing over the, you know, like, like pausing over the picture that, that we wanted and then moving on. And I'd written produced by Tara Wyatt on it. So, you know, that would be cool. So like, yeah, and, and wrote it in the musical style, Libra Badoni. And then yeah, she just, yeah, walking around the flat doing this. And, you know, I had to clean it all up. She wasn't too happy. But at the same time, <laughs> no, I'm joking. She was awesome. This was the house that you were like, this is when you were like living with um, Luke and Tara, right? No, when I oh. moved to Luke and Tara, I pulled it all over. And that was the crazy oh. thing. So we had all of these things stuck all over the wall and everywhere. <laughs> it was, I mean, I'll be honest, I'm amazed that they put up with me stick it like their wall. Like, there was a point I'd written in here. I've got it somewhere. I'll certainly pitch it. I wrote on the wall um, Stanley Kubrick quote, which was film should be like music, should flow like okay. music. So I'd written mm-hmm. that on the wall to, to try and, you know, a bit like you. Yeah, you hear about like Steve Jobs going in and writing something on the wall for people to think about. I don't know why I did it, but you know, Luke and Tara didn't shout at me, so I got away with it. You know, it was perfect. Uh, that's all. That's all you got. Yeah, do, great, right? lot of fun. Yeah. We had a great family atmosphere. I'll be honest. The whole team. It like, definitely just felt that really like, got when on. you guys were up on stage. Yeah, like, I mean, they probably don't like me talking too much, but yeah, they're they're a great they're a great pair of people. She's heavily pregnant. Gonna, you know, I spoke to her this morning. I've plagued her for two years about this film and yeah now she's getting a little bit of time off i think or hopefully anyway <laughs> yeah and i guess um the last question we have is where uh where can um people where are people going to be able to watch this and like tim here he hasn't gotten to see it yet like yeah. is it oh, like going to be well, at some virtual festivals that yes we can just so buy some tickets to? virtual Yes, Malibu's virtual. I didn't mean to interrupt you then. Sorry. I'm, I'm, oh, it's all I'm good. It's all good. All we talk uh, all over each other constantly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Very but, common thing. Yeah. Here. Go to, go to um, Malibu Amazing International Film Festival, right? Uh, they're, uh, yeah, I think I, with them it's the 20, 20th till the 24th, I think it is. So it's next week. And there, I think it's $5 for a kind of online pass oh, awesome. to watch okay. the film or to watch yeah. all of them. So it's not too bad. And yeah, otherwise, uh, I think we're on in. This one in Barcelona is an in-person, but we're attending it virtually. Um, the one in, yeah, the one in Sarasota is uh, is live. So we're going to be there. And apparently, I've just read, Kenny G has got Kenny a documentary G. going there. <laughs> Kenny G's documentary. I mean, mate, Man, it's Anthony all good. B, Kenny G, it's the fight of the musicians. <laughs> you, got this. you got this. <laughs> and then there's a then there's a Ron Howard one that's like about oh God. Like chefs and homeless people. So I'm like, wow, this is you know big leagues or whatever. You yeah. know, I'm a bit, <laughs> a bit nervous now. You know, will they how will they handle me and my headbands and stuff? But yeah, we'll see. It's going to be a lot of fun. And very cool. Yeah, oh we, yeah, yeah. And, and then if, oh yeah, and the final the final one is the the Richmond that's in person too. So yeah, there's going to be mm. a few virtual ones. We're hoping to be in in quite a few. So I'll keep keep you updated. But. Yeah, yeah, keep an eye on our uh, Facebook and on our website because Tara is going to be putting on some stuff as well to show where where people can find us and all that kind of stuff. Richmond's but, yeah, um, let's hope that people like it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Richmond's like what in June? Yeah, June. Uh, in fact, it's the lead up to my birthday, so that's even better. Ooh, like, oh, sorry. Nice. <laughs> Isn't it? My, my wife and I share the same birthday, June twelfth. Right? Oh, well, I'm giving out my bank details and everything else, but yeah, June 12th yeah, I just need birthday, um, your social yeah. security number next. And yeah, no great. problem. So I'll give you... <laughs> <laughs> and my American Express is. Uh, <laughs> yeah, she's. So we 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 share the same birthday, so that's the lead up to the birthday. So you know, hopefully, uh, she can come along with me as well. But yeah, we'll yeah. see. If she can't, then I'll, I'll fly back in on my on my birthday. But yeah, I think that's mm. the first till the tenth of june so nice yeah nice. and if you guys ever want to come along as i said it's probably i, will, I you mean it's only seven Luke hours i've us. got a baby so yeah come and see me <laughs> come on stage we'll just do this and just, 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 just like, yeah, i don't know yeah. how we did a podcast once There's people yeah people queued up for the next film and we'll just be sitting there <laughs> chatting that works with I'll me. I'll bring my harmonica. We can do some vibbing. You know, I, I have a harmonica, <laughs> but I don't know how to play it yet. I got a kazoo. You don't know how to play it? Mine's somewhere around here. My my when my grandpa passed, uh shoot, what was it? 
in 2019. He, I ended up inheriting his nice harmonica and I've been like, I need to learn how to play this now. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Mate, I've learned uh, Isn't She Lovely, which I was playing down on the front in Beaufort and I've learned that one and <laughs> hopefully nobody will ever say, oh, can you play this? Because I've managed to do that. I bet I've managed to be like, and they're like, oh, you play that harmonica? And I go, yeah. And they're like, what can you play? <laughs> uh, I tell you what, I'll play you this one. You'll know this, right? And I play it and then I'm like, Please don't say. Don't ask for yeah. more. <laughs> Only one. Learn. Just learn Freebird. Yeah, Freebird. Yeah. Like, Freebird. I've looked. I've looked to it because it's got this little button on the side that changes the uh, the chromaticism. Yeah. Right. I've uh, I've I've just learned to do twentieth um, century Fox. You know, which is just pushing that button, and and you know that one gets a second laugh. But so far, nobody's asked for the third one. That's good. Yeah. So you'll hear about me though one day. You'll be like, this guy, there's a guy who plays harmonic he plays, isn't she lovely? And the 20th century fox <laughs> theme. I'm a, I'll walks just start away. <laughs> I'll just start spreading rumors that you um are just like some unknown harmonica artist. Yeah. Trying to make a bid. <laughs> so now everybody's yeah. gonna I might so take it. it, I might take it with me. And then if people aren't, you know, if people aren't listening in the audience or something when I'm doing the QA, I'll just start, you know, ripping you on uh, <laughs> and isn't she questions. lovely? <laughs> Yeah, so what, did, so what that, did you... Did I answer your last question, or is this the last question now? Sorry. <laughs> oh, yeah, that was the last question. I, I, no, no, I no. I, I go that, was, that, was, that wasn't me checking you. I was seeing if you'd asked it. I can't remember I did, what I did. the question I was. I was trying to find out when you watch it, because we were like, dude, you got to watch oh, this. Yeah. And I was like, I don't yeah. think you can watch it before. Let's make some questions. <laughs> so. No, honestly, and I can I can ask uh, if I, I don't know how many links are allowed in to go out now. Uh, it's yeah. not me because you know me. I would literally send it to everybody, every man, woman, and child. I would be, <laughs> you know, there wouldn't be a person on this planet that didn't receive. I'd be it'd be tantamount to spam, you know, like one of those people who's telling <laughs> you that he's got like, like this link. Got an, <laughs> yeah, like his uncle's a deposed king or something. I'm <laughs> right. the guy who's just going, oh, watch my documentary, please. But yeah. It's, uh, so yeah, oh. but if if uh, if you can't see it, I'll have a word with Tara and see if there's a way that she nah, can potentially give I, you a link. So. I think I think we're yeah. um I think you got another uh, Biff uh, movie in Malibu with you with reopening. Oh yeah, that's in that's over at Malibu Film Festival. Yeah, they were cool. I see those two were nice. Yeah, they were they were great. Yeah, we we talked to them right before the award show. <laughs> they were like, oh, oh yeah, really? Yeah, so it was kind of cool. Yeah, they were really nice people. And they're from Groundlings as well, which is like all improv stuff that they do. Over yeah. There. That's, that's really cool to watch, actually. Those people can just think on the feet like I've never seen people do. Amazing. I know. I don't know how they do it. <laughs> yeah. Don't know how I do it, but be honest, it's just because I don't follow that thread. You know what I mean? Just keep going. Mm -hmm. Keep talking, yeah. Chris, and hopefully somebody will interrupt. <laughs> You'll get somewhere. Somebody, somebody, will, somebody yeah. will interrupt you, and then they'll, they'll just keep going with you. And then you take back <laughs> yeah. over, and then it'll be three hours later, and... We'll be here. It's when you listen, you listen back to this and you go, he never answered one question. He was like a politician. <laughs> he avoided every answer. I asked him about the film and he talked about his dog's birthday or something. Like, yeah. No, it's, hey, it's been a lot of fun. I've enjoyed every second of this. Yeah. Yeah. No, I guess. Thanks for having us, guys. Yeah, I don't, yeah. I don't have any more questions that I need on this uh, recording. <laughs> uh, uh, so, yeah, if yeah, just to, I guess just keep us posted as things uh, kind of take off. Obviously, we're following your Instagram, so um, we'll yeah, stay. We can, start, we can yeah. spread the word too from yeah. ours. Yeah. Oh, that'd be amazing. Yeah, as I said, uh, I'm I'm uh, I'm out uh, I'm out there uh, in Sarasota at the beginning of April. I'm really nice. excited about that. It's uh, and you know I've got lots of uh, cool kicks and things to wear at the event. So yeah, nice. get ready, <laughs> get ready for some wild color clothing wig. choices. Yeah. <laughs> Listen, blonde wig's not there. <laughs> Chris isn't here, but this person hurts Von Rental is. It? It'd be amazing. Yeah. It'd be like it'd be like Andy Kaufman and that Tony Curtis. <laughs> yeah. Oh, but anyways. Well, thanks for coming on, Chris. Yeah, yeah. appreciate thanks it. Thanks so much for having me. Sorry for talking over you guys. And no, you're thanks good. For, yeah, letting me it's indulge yourself in talking about me. <laughs> all right. No, you're very, you're very welcome. Thank you. Yeah, whoever's listening, thank you very much. Please don't, uh, yeah, please don't sue. <laughs> I'll just, if I get a cease and desist, I'll just, you know, cut that part, cut that part. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah cut it out. Yeah. yeah. 
pass it to my alter ego, Hertz von Rental. Right. You, you, you're trying to find a way out of this podcast now, and I'm just disrupting the whole thing. Sorry. <laughs> oh, you, 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 did a countdown. <laughs> no, you did a countdown in. You should do a count up to finish. Count, that would be like a really good. Cool. You know, you did, uh, I'll attempt. Wait, three, two, one. I have to go one, two, three. <laughs> one, okay. a two, a three, something like that. Yeah. <laughs> All yeah, right, do, and do the question mark at the end so it leaves people wondering. Uh, yeah. <laughs> All right. All right, Tim, you got to do like do it with the um oh. yeah, go. Do the I'll do a little, little oh, outro. Yeah. No. Oh, I can't do that. <laughs> <laughs> but I got a 1, a 2 and a 3. <laughs>